So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to all the LMK families out there. So Mrs. Egan and Mr. Spector and I have been excited about this day. We've been thinking about this since, I would say, um, the beginning of the year and really going back to the day that we had to leave this building, which has been over a year, and it seems that it's really the right time. Um, we walk around the building, and I would say to you that the conversations we have are again and again about when's the day that students return. And so knowing that it's coming up really soon has put an extra excitement throughout the building. And tonight we're gonna to talk with you about three particular areas of focus. We're gonna begin with an overview of the physical health and safety of the school, which will include um, some of the logistical pieces as well, followed by an overview of the social and emotional work that has been happening in the building and will continue to. And then we will follow that up by speaking about curriculum and instruction, including, as Dr. Wood was mentioned before, ongoing assessment of your children in order to provide them the best instruction for the remainder of the year, the summer, and next school year. And with me tonight is, of course, Dr. Wool, our superintendent of schools, our board of education, Vice President Kelly Kozak, also a uh, proud mom at LMK, our board of education trustee, Robert Sullivan, Dr. Brian Labig, our assistant superintendent for human resources, Michael Greenfield, our assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, Jen Egan and Scott Spector, our two assistant principals, and Jen also happens to be our IB MYP coordinator. Marlene Colonna, Director of Social Studies, Veronica D'Andrea, Director of Mathematics, Dr. Jamie Cantor, Director of English Language Arts, Kelly Malcheski, our Director of Guidance, Danny Gonzalez, our Assistant Director for Physical Education, Health and Athletics, Julie Snyder, our Director of Special Education, and Antonio Semeo, our Secondary Supervisor for Special Education. And so I wanna take a moment and thank three particular groups. First, the faculty and staff at LMK, who have embodied our district core values of rigor, equity, ensuring access, and most importantly, adaptability. We've asked so much of the staff here, more than ever before, and each time each of you have worked together as a collaborative team, you've innovated, and you've really created the most wonderful learning environment day in and day out. And our clerical staff, our custodial staff, our bus drivers, our food service workers have worked tirelessly day after day, again, adapting to this quite difficult year and making it very successful. And each day when I go to classrooms and I see teachers, I'm often amazed at the work that can happen. It's almost as if they never skip a beat. They just went on and on creating new ideas and new ways to engage children. And parents and guardians out there, and for that matter, grandparents and older brothers and sisters, in my 15 years in this community, I've never felt the stronger partnerships I had this year. You've been patient with us. We've made many changes. And your feedback has been really important to our growth in school this year. You've been supportive of our work and I can't thank you enough for the numerous notes that you've sent to staff. They always seem to come at the right moment when we need that extra little email or phone call with the kind words. I wanna thank our PTA who've been a support to all of us and to you as a community in our building throughout the pandemic. And all of you have helped us get to this day. And the third group, and what I believe is, I guess the most important is the students. I've never been as proud as I have been this year to say I'm the principal at LMK. Each day our students came in, have come in ready to learn, develop new levels of independence with their work each day in class, made new relationships with different peers from different communities and different classes, and amazing support for one another. Each day you bring a smile to my face, and I know you can't see it behind the mask, but I promise you it's there. And the day will come when we will all be sitting around together, smiling at each other, because to me, you keep me going on a daily basis to make this place really what it is, a wonderful learning environment. And so Lou, I will uh, turn it over to you as we move through the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. It was a wonderful sentiment. Couldn't agree more. Jen, can we have the first slide? So welcome back, everybody. I see we've crested 200 participants. That's wonderful. Um, Tomorrow is a big day in our district. We'll bring back all of our kindergarten through fifth graders for the first time in over a year. Think about that, folks. You have been in lockdown with your children for over a year. 
And while you're excited, I think in a couple of weeks, you are also going to be a little bit sad. This has been a unique time for families to nest and spend time with their children. It will be better, but different. So we are targeting a return for the middle school and high school for April 7th. That's actually a Wednesday after the spring break. And you might ask why in the middle of the week? Well, we've debated a number of return dates. One of our great concerns is that sometimes people don't behave well when they are on vacation. And we really need your support, especially in light of the, govern the governor's recent changes to the quarantine rule, that when you go away, if you should go away on spring break, whether it's in state, out of state or anywhere else, behave as if you should be quarantining before you send your children back to school. So when we return, Monday and Tuesday will be typical hybrid days. And on Wednesday, we'll bring all of our middle school and high school students back. That is, if everything goes according to plan over the spring break as we finish setting up all of the mitigations that we need to make sure your children are safe when we bring them back. Primarily, we're still installing the air filtration systems, and we expect to have them all in hand well before the 7th but sometimes uh, fate takes our hand as it did several weeks ago when there was a snowstorm in Houston. So you will hear from me again in writing over the break just to verify that our start date is still April 7th. And at that point, we will welcome your return. But when you come back on Monday, you will continue in your hybrid schedule. And Mr. Fried will speak more about that later. Next slide, please. So this is a, a very important thing for you to know and remember. Why now? What's changed? Um, well, in some ways, nothing has changed. All of my decisions and the decisions of the Board of Education are made on the same thing that they were when we were trying to figure out how to reopen schools this past summer. The health and safety of students, faculty, and staff to the greatest extent possible. And pretty much we were all sort of floundering in the dark back then, and so we took lots of precautions. However, we have learned a lot since then, and we'll talk about some of the changes we have made. We're also very focused on how we maintain some continuity of instruction. We realize how difficult this has been on students, particularly secondary students, where there have been more quarantines and students have experienced in-person, quarantine learning, hybrid learning, some have remained virtual. But going forward, we will no longer have a hybrid model you'll have two options. You'll have in-person or you'll have full virtual learning. Full virtual learning will be different than it has been in the past. Students will be ex expected to attend school every day via uh, Zoom or Google Classroom. Uh, finally, we have spent a lot of time, as Scott already mentioned, planning for this return. It's not as if students have been out of school for a year just going to turn all the lights on and say welcome back and think that everything is going to just start up as it did when they left. We realize that every child has experienced the pandemic differently. Some kids have actually thrived. Some kids have struggled. Some kids are sort of in between. There's a lot of anxiety about coming back. And so we have prepared thoughtfully, and you'll learn more about that as the night unfolds, how we're going to attend to not only the academic needs of your children, but first and foremost, their social and emotional well-being. Next slide, please. So people say to me a lot, why don't you? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And I think sometimes we all forget that as much as we'd like to think that the school board and I are in control, we're not. We have some ability to manage the system, but we are governed by the governor and his executive orders. And way back when he prioritized, and we certainly agree, to get kids back to school full time as quickly as possible. The circumstances have now evolved enough that we're able to do that. Next slide. But this is who's really in charge. The New York State Department of Health. We are governed uh, and required to adhere to all of their mandates and guidance. As you can see from the screen, they haven't updated their guidance in a very long time. So that's a big problem for us. Uh, the New York State Department of Education hasn't really helped us much. And the Centers for Disease Control, this, this slide is actually incorrect, was updated just last week. And they have finally caught up to where we are. 
However, the state has not. So all the things we've been advocating for uh, throughout, no barriers, prioritize ventilation, um, three feet of social distancing, six feet for music, all those things are in the brand new guidance that was just published, I think, uh, March 13th. And New York State has yet to adopt any of those changes. So right now, we don't have some of the luxuries we'd like to see in place when we open school. Primarily, we're, we really believe that the barriers uh, make it much harder on kids to hear and for teachers to teach. Next slide. So as I already mentioned to you, in the middle of this Venn diagram, we used to see something called hybrid learning. That was independent learning that your chil children did on their own on the days that they were not in person. That has gone away. So by now you should have filled out the survey, but if you haven't, Dr. Laidwood will put it in the chat for you to fill out. If you haven't filled it out, please do so immediately. We need some important information from you. Will you be a virtual learner or an in-person learner? Will you be able to transport your children? We hope you will. That will help us with social distancing. And will you require lunch and breakfast if you're in either of those models? So please, if you haven't filled out the survey, make sure that you do. But so online learning will be every day now. Face-to-face -face learning will be every day. Hooray. Next slide. Um, I want to talk about this first bullet because I want you to remember again what, what Scott said in his opening remarks, and I couldn't agree with him more. The people who have had to extend themselves further than anyone else are our teachers. And so I want to just be clear on what the virtual option is supposed to be and ask that you not abuse it. So make a decision if you don't think your children are safe to keep them home. We think it's safe to send your children back to school, and we hope that you will. But there are lots of personal circumstances that indicate a choice maybe to remain virtual. But don't move your kids back and forth. For example, if you're going to take a vacation when school is in session, that is not a reason to put your kids into a virtual learning model. We are going to define vacation as the time that school is closed from now to, until the end of the year. If your children are quarantined, we'll of course allow them to zoom in. But let's be mindful of the burden that having kids move from one environment to the other places on teachers. And we want all of you to come back. So if you decide that after a while you get more comfortable and your child has selected to be virtual and you want to come back, you can reach out to your principal. And if it doesn't disrupt current classes and we can accommodate that return more quickly, you would not be required to stay virtual for the remainder of the marking period. But we ask that you try to think about the, the teacher in this environment. Our teachers are working really hard. They care just as much about the kids learning virtually as the ones in person. They do a lot of planning. So if you can make a decision and try to stick with that decision, that would help us a lot. Um, obviously, all of these rules are reiterations. We expect your kids to keep their cameras on so we can monitor uh, how they're doing and the teachers can have direct interaction with them. I mentioned the quarantine issue already. and if you travel, New York State has eased its rules about quarantining. As you know from my letter, I am recommending that you not ease your own. So that if you take a vacation, we recommend that you self-quarantine for four days and that you get a PCR test before you return your children to school. Why is that so important? Because if we're going to keep our schools open, we need your help. Dr. Laid, we can tell you, and he will in a little while, that we have found virtually no student-to-student -student infections in our building since we opened. We've had a handful of infections, perhaps between adult to adult, but by and large, infection makes it into our school by the behaviors that occur outside of the school day. So if we work at this together and we err on the side of caution, irrespective of the governor saying you don't have to quarantine and you return from travel, we ask that you exercise caution so that we can keep all of our kids in school and keep them safe. Next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, fellas and ladies, you can monitor the chat for me, the Q&A rather, and see if there's anything you can respond to. So what's changed? Why now? Well, a lot has changed. When we began this journey, I was always concerned about the safety of your children. 
but quite honestly, I was mostly concerned about the safety of our teachers, faculty, and staff, because as we know, COVID is much more difficult on adults. And so the game changer for us was having access to vaccinations for all of our adults. And very recently, we were able to get two dedicated days from the Westchester County Department of Health so that any of our faculty or staff that hadn't been able to get an appointment was able to access a vaccine if they were medically eligible to do so. So most of our faculty and staff happily have protection. We also need to know what's going on in our schools. And Dr. Ladwig, along with the principals, have worked tirelessly to put surveillance testing in place. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, and it's been very successful. If you haven't already given us permission to uh, perform a test on your son or daughter, please do so tonight, if you will. Dr. Lade, we will also put that uh, permission in the chat. And the more broad-based the survey, the more uh, the more broad-based surveillance, the more meaningful the uh, testing is. If we're only testing the same group of kids again and again, that's not really helpful. Now, why is surveillance testing important? Because the CDC says you should increase the level of mitigation in your school if your community infection rate goes up and you need to be able to compare it to your in-school infection rate. So the good news is we will have an in-school infection rate. Right now, that's zero. Uh, but if the community behaves in a way that drives the infection rate up, it could require that I return students to hybrid or even full virtual learning. So we are always in this together. The other game changer um, is that giant machine that you see sitting there. We have put, purchased one for every classroom in the district. And uh, I did get one parent ask me, why didn't you do this in September? The answer for that is simple. The technology didn't exist then. That machine, which will uh, sit in every classroom, draws in air from the bottom it has a HEPA filter, a MERV filter, and a UV light system, and it literally kills COVID. It cleanses the air three to seven times, depending on the size of a classroom, in a 45-minute period. So we can guarantee that the air in all of our classrooms will be clean and safe. It works whether the window's open or not. So we can, when the summer months come and it gets a little warmer, we can open the windows. It'll do have the same level of effectiveness. We are excited about that because it's not only going to protect us now, it's going to protect us going forward. It removes flu and cold virus. So clean air is always a good thing. And we're very excited about that. If you've been following our board meetings, you know that I was vehemently op opposed to putting barriers on desks. And the CDC now has agreed with me uh, a little bit late, but New York State is not caught up. Why am I opposed to barriers? Well, it's really simple. Um, it degrades the ability for ventilation to flow across the room, right? You have these barriers sitting around each child's desk, a trifold. But if you can see me at home, I'm sitting at my desk. This is what kids do. They sit inside this little uh, plastic dome, and then they reach back and they go, hey, can, you, can I borrow a pencil? And the whole thing is defeated. There is no value in the barriers that we can see. The, bar the best uh, barrier we have is this mask. If I wear it and you wear it, it's just a simple paper two-ply mask. We reduce the rate of infection by over 91%. The other hardship it poses for teachers is it's hard to hear if you're a student. It's hard for a teacher to project their voice, and it's hard for kids to see. So hopefully, New York State will catch up with us and the CDC, and at some point in the not-too-distant future, maybe we'll be able to remove those barriers. In addition, we're gonna to continue to do all the good work that we've done. We're gonna disinfect our uh, classrooms every night, hydrostatically, and some other safety features that we'll talk about in a second. Next slide, please. Dr. Well, there were a couple of questions um, regarding- let's, let's take a look. Um, okay. If I can answer for, for the yeah, question. Please. There's a question that, that asked about, would it be okay to come back for the fourth quarter? We don't foresee in the building any problem with people coming back for the fourth quarter like they've been doing throughout the year, coming back in accordance with the beginning. We're um, working carefully to plan for the return of all students, which is our ultimate goal. So I don't see it as an issue. Yes, and, and you know, I do see the question, and by the way, uh, Ms. Grant, we, we agree with you. We struggled with whether or not we should bring all of the kids back after spring break as well. And ultimately, the reason I decided that we were going to do that 
because we feel as if the kids are safer in school where they're supervised and all of their activity is monitored than, bringing, than, than allowing them to stay home for another week. I have to say it was, it was a struggle even for me to reach that decision. But you can always return from virtual learning provided that it's not uh, um, a difficulty on, on the principal to fit kids into the classes that they need to go into. And as Mr. Free just said, we don't anticipate that being a problem. But the sooner you can make that decision, the better, because it'll stabilize the environment for teachers and for your children. Uh, let's see, my son informed me that students will not have access to lockers. Scott, you wanna speak to the locker question? Sure, it's actually uh, on this slide. Um, one of the things that we found is that movement throughout the building is important. And the quicker we can get students to go from point A to point B eliminates the congregating of students um, in a place where they might be side by side. We've tried and successfully kept students within a six feet distance for most of the movement throughout the building. Even at three feet, placing students at lockers means over the time period of a the day, they'll spend anywhere from probably more than 15 minutes side by side with students, which just to us is not efficient in maintaining a safe environment. I recognize and the building does the um, concern that a few might have with regard to lockers, but we've been successful throughout the year, limiting the amounts that are in backpacks and we can continue to, and we have space in the classrooms. Luckily, the middle school has large enough classrooms. And of course, on a case by case basis, if someone really has a concern, they can always call me and we can talk it through and make a plan for that particular child. And thank you, Scott. There's a bunch of good questions. You guys have wonderful questions tonight, and some of them are. I can't tell you how disappointed I am about the barriers. Our teachers already have workarounds, though. Sadly, if if in fact kids can't see the board, the smart board can be viewed on their uh, computer screen. But we are hoping that that's going to move along very quickly. We may be asking for your help to advocate. And Dr. Lady, would you take on the question? We advise people to quarantine for the four days, but maybe you could speak to what is and what isn't uh, currently going on in New York State. Sure. So uh, currently the travel quarantine um, would normally require 10 days uh, of return. But at the moment, uh, people can test out of quarantine by getting a test within 72 hours of returning to New York. That is to say 72 hours before the return to New York. And they quarantine for three days and on the fourth day they get a second test and if both those tests are negative they can uh, be removed from quarantine within four days so that's where the four-day standard comes uh, but it's also important to note that as of april 1st travelers uh, returning to new york after april 1st from domestic travel only not international travel are not going to be required to quarantine and as dr will uh, mentioned before that gives us a lot of concern because we know that if people are traveling over spring break they may be coming back, and if they don't follow uh, common sense, we think good common sense to quarantine and just be sure that they haven't been exposed and bringing it back to the school, there's the risk of increased infection. So we're asking for everybody's cooperation with that. Thank you. And, and just to say out loud, we can't mandate you follow a rule anymore. That You're isn't... muted. Whoops. I'm muted? Actually, I'm not. Can you hear me? Okay. So... We can't mandate that you um, follow a rule that is no longer a law, but we are asking for you to use your common sense. As you note in my letter, I thought this was a foolish decision on the part of the New York State Department of Health. Of all the things they could be doing to help us, they did something that actually doesn't help us. And so we're asking for your help. So if you're going on vacation, we're asking that when you return, try to plan your vacation so that you have four days before you have to come back to school so your children don't miss school, ideally. But if you can't do that, if you've already made your plans, then we ask that you quarantine your kids, you self-quarantine, and you at, at a minimum get a test before they return to school. That is what we're hoping you will do. We can't mandate it. I'm going to keep coming back to this. We want our schools open now until the day your children finish in June or graduate in June. In order to do that, we need your help. All right, so Mr. Free. Just to just to clarify, Dr. Will, there's a couple questions. Just saying the the return the week that um, after vacation when people return, if they've already planned a vacation and are returning on a Saturday, can they self quarantine for a day or two of that first week and then return after mm -hmm. they self quarantine? 
you may remember in my letter, one of the things I said to you was we are going to allow people, even if you have chosen in-person learning, that is your first choice, but you planned your vacation assuming no quarantine, we will allow you to Zoom for that first week so that you can quarantine for a full four days and get your test. You could return on Friday in theory, we wouldn't object to that. Why are we doing this? Because we know, as some of you have already pointed out, what happened after the, the holiday break in the winter and what happened after winter break. So we're asking that you be your own best friend. Make sure that you keep your children safe and keep other people's children safe. Scott, you want to take them through this slide? Sure. Um, Lou, just if I can quickly answer one of the questions, um, because there was a couple about process when it comes to going out. The general process in the building is the communication lines go with the school nurse and our guidance department. They've coordinated this. So if a parent was staying out um, and needed some questions or needed to let a particular person know, if you contact our school nurse, Sufi Aranza, and the guidance counselor for the grade, they'll coordinate, they'll shift the child over to virtual for the couple of days. It's very seamless. You've been doing it all year long, it won't be a problem. And, and Kelly, I'm sorry, the answer to your question, Kelly McGovern is no, if somebody is infected, not the whole class, but Brian, you wanna answer the specifics of how we decide who gets quarantined and who does not? Sure, this guidance was um, somewhat recently updated by the Westchester County Department of Health and the New York State Department of Health. So the standard that we have to apply is that any uh, individual who has close contact, which is defined as six feet or less for more than 10 minutes in a 24 hour period of time, that those individuals would need to quarantine. Uh, it gets slightly expanded in a place like a cafeteria where people may be eating and not therefore using their masks, in which case the rule of thumb that the Department of Health has a supply is a 12 foot standard. Anybody within that 12 foot ring around an individual who ends up testing positive would need to quarantine. Uh, but it's not gonna be the case that entire classes of students need to quarantine uh, only in a classroom setting within six feet. So what you're looking at in the pictures on the right are what Dr. Wu was referencing before. And you can see while I agree, it's not something that we like to have on the desk, you can see clear the top picture shows you if you're a child at one end of a table, you can see straight through to the front. Um, so while not the most perfect thing, they are very clear and they're brand new. And so it's two examples, one on a table, one on a desk. And that classroom furniture will be three feet. So if you're at a table, two children will share a table at three feet distance. And if you're at a desk, you'll be solo three feet apart. The barriers there, everything else remains the same. Chorus, physical education, 12 feet. There's signs throughout the building stairwells, lockers I mentioned. And when we enter and exit the building, we socially distance, we have designated entrances and exits and supervision all over the building at all times. And I would just say we're lobbying to reduce the 12 feet to six, because it makes no sense to me The kids can play interscholastic sports, but they can't take physical education. And by the way, the CDC has now said six feet as well, but we'll wait for New York State to catch up on that. Next slide, please. So this is where we need your help. Um, it's not as if we could order more buses even if we wanted to. Bus companies don't keep extra buses around or extra bus drivers. So if you can continue to transport your children, that's a great help to us because obviously we're better able to social distance students if we have fewer children on the bus. Again, I'll remind you to check the chat. If you didn't answer that survey, please do so before you leave the meeting tonight. Uh, let's see, is there anything else on here we want to talk about? All this is old news for you guys. You've been doing this since the beginning of the year. Kids wear uh, masks on the buses, single child to a seat, unless we can't fit it that way. First, if we have to put two, we start with siblings. But beyond that, there could be an occasion where there are two kids on a seat. We hope not. It hasn't happened yet. That's where your help will be in, in very significant. And Scott, you've already talked about, I think you've already implemented your new drop-off system. Is that right? Yeah, that's why it's actually not in purple. Um, about a week or two, a couple of weeks back, we planned, because we're always thinking about the future, and we know that there's going to be many more cars. So parents, you've been wonderful in adjusting back to the original way we did it, which is you drop off along any of our two designated sidewalks, and we'll check your students as they walk up the stairs. 
Yes, and, and we will talk about mass breaks. So some of the th questions you're asking and the plexiglass will not be cleaned between periods and they are not transportable. They'll be cleaned once a night. Students have the option of covering their desk with a, a, a piece of paper that we've been providing throughout the course of the year. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. All right, next uh, slide, please. All right, face coverings and, and mass breaks. Mr. Freed, you're on. Okay, so the face coverings continues. Um, and as you can see, it's an example. Every student, they've been really incredible anywhere on the campus. Um, the exceptions, of course, being um, specific things like eating and drinking, Dr. Lay we mentioned earlier, some medical conditions and mass breaks, which you will see a picture of and uh, Scott Spector will speak a little bit more detail. But we, of course, continue to ask you to do the job you've done wonderfully, which is sending everybody in with multiple masks and if a mass breaks, we always have supplies and visitors come into the building at every time. They also follow all these rules and regulations. We temperature check them. And this has been really perfect this year. People follow the rules in, in a wonderful way. And I would have to say mass breaks is one of those other positives of the pandemic. It's probably the most fun I have is looking out my window, watching kids on mass breaks. I think it's a tradition. Even when we don't have masks, they're gonna want these breaks. We'll just call them mental health breaks. Next slide, please. So we ask that everybody continues to be diligent and fill out the daily COVID questionnaire every single day. Um, all students need to be screened at home, all visitors when they get here. And we encourage students to download the Safe to Speak app. We can drop that into the chat, Dr. Wool. So if anybody wants the link, um, we'll send that out. We sent it out to families. We shared it with the students and we can do it again here. And again, I can send it out to the families at home as well. In the event that your child doesn't have a phone, um, thus not being able to have the Safe to Speak app, we can make sure they have a QR code, which is what they use throughout K-5, to which is the little square it has the thing. And our uh, people who are checking will just scan it quickly. It's fine as well. And if you need any of those, um, Jen Egan has them at all times. If I can quickly answer the, the question in the Q&A, April 19th, I believe, is the first day of the fourth marking period. And Andrea, the question you asked is a really good question. And the answer is, if you get a negative test because you've self-quarantined, it would be great if you shared it with the nurse. Once again, we can't mandate that you do that, but it, it's appreciated. And anytime people are making that kind of effort, we, 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 we think that's very worthwhile. So here is uh, our head custodian, Joey Pinto, modeling the every day after school uh, cleaning of every room with the sanitation spray. We use the electrostatic disinfectant applicators throughout the school. Um, all of it is EPA approved. Our cleaning is ongoing. It's throughout the day. It's throughout the afternoon into the evening. Um, it's constant. And it's been yeoman's work by our custodial staff, Dr. Will. It's been great. Yeah, I, I eat lunch regularly in the cafeteria and it's it's really spotless and the kids are terrific at obeying the rules. Next slide. So again, this is more of what we will continue to, which is we have hand washing and we've removed all of the old water fountains with water filling stations. And you can just see they're in different places. There's one in the hall, there's one in the uh, library and of course water filling stations are throughout the building. And the students bring in water bottles and you can see them constantly filling it up, which, cause we want them to keep hydrated. So this will continue throughout the building. Reminder to send your kids with water bottles if you haven't already done that. Um, this one I mentioned earlier, um, just to highlight, students enter the building and there, there's a flow of traffic at the arrival and they're checked as I mentioned earlier for screening. And they use assigned exits. Uh, early in the year, when we, uh, in the summer, excuse me, when we began the year, we assigned the teachers to share with their class. If you teach the last period of the day, you know where to tell your students when they leave the building which exit to use. It makes the flow of traffic um, much easier. And since they're all going out to the main area to get picked up, it alleviates the traffic by having them use multiple exits. One of the good things about LMK is there are a lot of ways to get out, which is both safe and also makes for social distancing a lot easier. I'm gonna turn this one over to uh, Jen Egan because she's been coordinating lunch all year. Thank you. 
Um, so first of all, I just want to say that just to echo what Dr. Wool said, in the cafeterias and in all of our lunch spaces, students have been doing an amazing job following the protocols, enjoying themselves safely, and it's really been a great thing to see. So we really do appreciate all of them really being just so um, wonderful during our lunch periods. And uh, to prepare for all students returning uh, to school, we're going to have students continue to sit in their assigned lunch seat because we do have them cohorted by team and by section. And since we're going to need to remain uh, six feet apart at lunch, we are going to add additional lunch spaces. So students might have alternating lunch locations. So our students who are sitting in the main cafeterias will alternate every other day to the gymnasium, to gym, gym A, which we're going to make a lunch space. And students who are currently eating in the LGIR and the library are going to continue to use these spaces and perhaps even switch uh, into the library lab from the LGIR. Uh, we are going to be adding lunch lines and registers to accommodate for all students. And uh, as always, we're going to continue to uh, encourage students to go outside. They have access to the beautiful courtyard and the field to socialize with their peers. And uh, during that time, mask wearing and social distancing will continue to be enforced. So again, we're really, we are so excited to see everybody back and our students have been doing a great job and we know that they're gonna continue to do so. Next slide, please. There we go. Whoa. Okay, Out, outdoor spaces. Um, so I actually just wanted to share before this meeting, um, after the school day ended, I, I took a walk outside just to enjoy spring finally being here. And I took a walk back to the new really incredible athletic fields in the back. I walked through our uh, newly renovated courtyard with the blooms coming out. I think they're crocuses. Um, and from all angles, the, the LMK building now is just so beautiful. And it reminded me um, just how lucky we are to have such a beautiful campus. And the outdoor spaces at LMK, we've always enjoyed. Students have always used a lot, utilized them. Teachers have always utilized them. But perhaps more this year than ever with the added layer of mitigation uh, that being outdoors can provide. Weather permitting, students have been this year and will remain outside during morning lineup, during mass breaks, as uh, you heard a little bit about, and I can say mass breaks are, I think, one of the signature successes, uh, if you could say that, of, of this time. Um, during lunch, during physical education classes, along with other instructional times that teachers are increasingly finding opportunities for, the students want to be outside. I think we all want to be outside, and, and we want them outside. So we're going to find every opportunity to continue to make sure we're using this beautiful campus outside that we have. Um, and I, I will just echo again, you, you've heard it a few times now, and I think you'll hear it again. The kids have been wonderful about, about being uh, careful, about being mindful, about following protocols, um, the expectations of distancing during mask breaks or uh, mask wearing if it's during lunch. Um, and it's really, really impressed us and we appreciate that. So when all the students are back together here at LMK, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to taking more of these walks outside and, and I'm looking forward to seeing all of them out there too. So a couple of quick scheduling adjustments. We've been functioning on a uh, schedule which goes one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. And the day we return on April 7th, would return to a typical one to six day schedule in a consecutive order, one to six, then back to one. The Wednesday, the seventh would be a day four. And one wonderful piece of news is that our orchestra and band lesson rotations, which have been held in a virtual setting, will return to the school. And if you are a child in the orchestra or band, you will have your lessons once in a six day cycle um, in a area where you can be a good 12 feet distance. So we're looking forward to having that return. And so I'd like to give, uh, oh, Scott, you can handle this, but I also want to bring Brian in to just talk about what's been going on and an overview of the results, but you, you take it out, take it out first. Sure. Um, so COVID surveillance testing is a couple of weeks into LMK. And unlike the elementary, which if you've been to those where they have the drive-through, ours takes place in the LMK auditorium. 
Parents get notified from Dr. Ladewig and we send a follow up the day before through text. And you drop off your students at the circular driveway, which is on Union Avenue. If you're a bus or a walker, you get off the bus or walk and you come right to the auditorium. Staff's there, they check you in. One of the nurses will perform the test. About 15 minutes later, you get the results and then you go right back to class. It's been very smooth. Um, just important that parents that you remind your children that they have the test. Uh, sometimes we all get busy and we, we are apt to you know, occasionally forget. And then we can, if they, if they do, we can always find the students in the building. But if we continue to remind them in the morning of the, their middle schoolers and they need to be reminded again and again, and this um, has been highly successful with no positive results, right, Dr. Leibwick? Yeah, that's right, Scott. We, uh, <clears throat> just to give folks a perspective on the numbers, um, at LMK, 70% of um, our students' parents have given consent for them to participate which is great. It gives us a large pool of uh, students able to participate, but I did uh, copy and paste the link to the consent form for anybody that wishes to uh, participate and hasn't already given us consent. Um, and I think it's been pretty widely publicized by now, but I'll just mention again, this is, um, it's the Binax Now Rapid Antigen Test, and it's a shallow nasal swab. So it's not the invasive swab that maybe some folks have had if they go to get a diagnostic test. Uh, this is uh, not unpleasant at all, and it literally takes just a matter of seconds. So far, we've tested 86 students and staff at LMK. And as Scott said, they've all been negative, which is great. Tuesdays have turned out to be our testing day at LMK. So we have another 56 students and staff being tested tomorrow, uh, which is great. And the test really serves two purposes. One, it lets us monitor for the presence of uh, COVID-19 in our school community. And the second is, because this surveillance testing is for asymptomatic students and staff, if we did find any positive results, uh, we'd be identifying people who are positive before they're symptomatic and able to get them to isolate, which obviously the benefit there is um, it minimizes the risk that they're gonna pass the virus to other people once they become symptomatic. So it's one of several mitigation strategies, uh, part of a comprehensive set of safety initiatives, but it's one that we're really pleased to have up and running and we plan to continue it um, every week for the rest of the year. Thank you, Dr. Lavin. Before we go too much further, Scott, I just want to uh, go over some of the questions in the chat. I'm going to assign them out to folks. So sixth graders already have a pretty good idea of how to navigate the building. It's now they're just being navigating with others, but I'm sure uh, if uh, Scott or Jen or Scott want to weigh in on that, please do. Somebody's muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I can speak to that. So you're right, Lou. The um, sixth graders have been here. Um, they've been here every every other day. I think the the navigation of the building is pretty sound. Um, I watch students every day. They know their way around. The challenges, of course, will be the connection that I'm going to speak to in a minute about on this piece. Mm -hmm. um, if I can, Lou, there are two other questions that follow it. Um, yeah, please. Wait one second. Before you move on, the question is specifically says for a child that hasn't been to school yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. I didn't see that. Um, I didn't either. That's excellent point, thank you. So we've had numerous students come in throughout the year who were in an all virtual setting. And we have numerous ways led by our, our excellent guidance department. Um, everything from teachers orienting them to the building, it usually begins by having them come down, a guidance counselor would sit with the child and go over their schedule with them. And it also would involve another student becomes almost like a mentor and a partner to that child. Takes them around the building, um, Ms. Egan will ensure they have a location in the cafeteria, often with a particular child who they might know already to make them feel more comfortable since we've already assigned the seats long ago. And the teachers will work with um, that individual child to help them acclimate to the ability to navigate the building. So it's kind of a, an all hands on deck combined ability and students are very adaptable and learn rather quickly. And I, I apologize that I missed that question because I was uh, misled by the sixth grade. So that's the same process, whether you're a seventh grader or an eighth grader. If you've never been to school, you'll be reoriented as if you were a new student. Uh, there are some, not many, virtual learners who have not been in our school yet. Uh, and that's a very good point. So that will be a, a different uh, approach that we would take with somebody that's been here before. Um, Mrs. Rinaldi, I don't know where that story is coming from. I can't speak to it, but I can tell you that I have every confidence that the teachers at the middle school 
have a really good sense of where their kids are and what is appropriate. I wouldn't say no homework is appropriate. I wouldn't say homework in, in a regular format is appropriate. I, I leave it to the expertise of individual teachers and in individual circumstances. And as somebody who lives in that building with them, I couldn't have more confidence in that faculty than I do. Uh, Scott, maybe th there are some individual problems here that maybe both Mrs. Egan and Mr. Spector can follow up on. We can help with organizing it so that your daughter's not carrying all her books. And I saw a question about the app being a challenge. Yeah, I, being, and so, I wrote back to that one privately. Yeah, individual okay. questions like those. We, um, I would say that's um, a system in the building, Dr. World, that I would always encourage anybody with questions about an individual piece, an app, a locker, a backpack, to contact either one of our two assistant principals or your child's guidance counselor. And to the point I want to make about the uh, question about the sixth grade and YouTube building, and I too apologize for misreading it, that would be the same for a child who just moves from another um, city, exactly. state, town, country. We, we do that on a regular basis. And you know, we pride ourselves, particularly the middle school, on personalizing the experience for kids. If your child's having a problem with something, it may not be a problem for everybody, but it's a problem for your child. You just need to reach out to the guidance counselor, one of the assistant principals, or Mr. Freed, and we will figure it out. That's what we do. Danny, I know you're typing the answer, but can you tell us, are parents allowed to watch? Uh, yeah, so I was just typing in that chat. Um, both for indoor and outdoor sports, each uh, student athlete will be allowed to have two spectators to attend uh, the event. Uh, before attending the, 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 the contest, they must fill out the crisis goal form, which is available on the homepage of our athletics website. And also your child's coach will be reaching out directly to the families with that link as well. So that's filled out um, prior to arriving on campus. If by any chance you do arrive on campus and you don't have it, we have iPads and computers available for parents and spectators to fill out before attending the event. Thank you, Danny. And those who don't know Danny, you're gonna to get to know a lot more about what Danny has been up to keeping your kids uh, psychologically sound as he's uh, managed to run a full intramural program in the middle of a pandemic. Scott, can you just explain, because there seems to be some confusion, the, safe, the, the safety app and the parent app, you have to have them both in order for it to work. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, sure. So parents, you know, have from, from day one had the app, which you fill out, that um, allows you through Crisis Go to report your child being healthy that day. The Safe to Speak app allows your child to have it on their phone. Uh, in many ways for you, it just is the ease. And if you don't have that app on your child's phone, you have to forward them the email. And we're trying to make life easier. You still have to fill it out yourself on your own phone. And once you do that, it automatically goes there and then the child has the green badge. And any child who has a particular problem with downloading the app, those questions are easily answered by either Ms. Egan or Mr. Spector or me. Um, or the guidance can help too. We're, we'll walk them through it. It's, it's a simple process that we can help them with. Don't worry about it. That's us just trying to make your life easier. It's one less thing for parents to do. You fill it out, it automatically populates your child's phone. So and, and, hoping, and also, I'm yeah. sorry, Dr. Will, also, please don't worry on a given day if something doesn't work like that, we can always do a quick temperature check and it takes a few seconds and move on from there. So um, welcoming students back. So. We're calling this unifying our learning community. And when the day begins, we're going to have the Husky and Pride cohorts connect and in some cases reconnect because our eighth graders are the ones who were in the building throughout sixth grade and the portion of seventh to create the one learning community that we're proud of here. We're gonna begin the day on Wednesday the seventh with an extended home base advisory. And it's gonna be a spirit oriented day. I've already spoken with the PTA. We're gonna also encourage students to wear the maroon and white colors of Harrison. And that first day's activity is gonna be one about connecting to each other. We're gonna ask students to reflect on their time that they've been through here and the experiences and how it's really helped them become better collaborators, communicators, and in many ways um, become deeper, more caring students for one another. And these all connect to the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Learner Profile that Ms. Egan's going to speak about in a few minutes, um, because we're so proud that we're now an IB Middle Years school. Those advisory activities are going to happen on a regular basis each week, and Mr. Spector is going to speak to that more in a few minutes. And our team-based program in the middle school 
is already working on ways to use some flexible time to have activities to connect students. For us, we've built Husky and Pride small, really wonderful learning communities. Um, Dr. Will mentioned how they go outside during mass breaks. They're in conversation with each other. They really know each other and they're very proud of their small communities. It's gonna be our job to bring the two together and make it just a larger and more wonderful community. And we're looking forward to that first day. And of course, in addition, we will go over the safety protocols, which our students know, and we'll remind our students um, of all the people who are there, because we do know that some of them are gonna need extra support for their social emotional well-being. But that gives me the opportunity now to turn this to Ms. Egan and Mr. Spector to speak about all the ways that we regularly have social emotional well-being. And we're gonna begin with Kelly Malchewski, our Director of Guidance, giving you like a broad overview of our approaches to social emotional well-being at the middle school. Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to speak to this slide. And what I think is most interesting about this particular slide is all of the themes that are on this slide have already surfaced in the presentation because really the social and emotional learning and approaches that are in place are, the, are what we anchor to every day as a district and certainly will continue to anchor to as your children um, return for the full return. Um, I'm gonna start by speaking to the bottom two elements in this pyramid, which is supportive environment environments and nurturing and responsive relationships. Again, this represents a framework that the entire district is using. And these bottom two tiers represent what we do for all students. So you'll see the ideas that Mr. Freed mentioned and we'll speak more specifically about around team meetings, school counselors or guidance counselors, advisory, home base, all of these things are already in place, but we have thoughtfully reconsidered them to make sure they're specific, differentiated, individualized for the full return of all students to school. Um, again, as Dr. Wool said earlier, every child has experienced the pandemic differently and every child will experience the full return differently. Um, the reality is we will monitor all students. We're ready to meet them where they are and we've thoughtfully considered all of this and we're um, sure to have um, general approaches in place for all learners as well as more targeted and intensive supports for learners who absolutely need it. Um, speaking to that, we'll, tonight will be the secondary supervisor of special education, Antonia Simeo. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, as Kelly mentioned, we are um, keenly aware of the adjustment that students are going to go through when they return to school in a couple of weeks. Uh, and with that being said, we have a staff of three school psychologists who are very highly skilled and trained in various clinical approaches to meet the needs of students. And the idea is, as we move up this pyramid, the more targeted and the more interventive, inter, inter, I'm sorry, intensive um, supports that they receive. So with that being said, um, Julie Snyder is going to share in a few minutes about the specific work the school psychologists have been doing. Um, but along that, we are excited that our school counselors and school psychologists work together to run very specific individual groups. Um, we also have partnership with our school psychologists and phys ed teachers. Um, and so with all that being said, I'm going to first turn it over to uh, Jen Egan, who is going to talk more about the MYP and IB learner profile. Thank you so much. Um, so as uh, Mr. Freed mentioned, we're very excited to be a middle years program school. And uh, one of the wonderful things, there are many, but one of the wonderful things about the IB middle years program is that it naturally supports students in their journey as social and emotional learners, because key components of social and emotional learning are embedded into different areas of the program. You heard mention of the IB learner profile, which is pictured on this slide in a graphic that's very familiar to our students. Uh, you can see this graphic all around our building. Um, the learner profile identifies traits for students to develop that go beyond academic success. Uh, these traits are explicitly discussed with students at multiple points in, of the year. And they're clearly defined for students so that way they can understand exactly what they mean and are able to reflect on their own personal growth as they strive to develop these attributes. Um, we're so proud of the fact that it is common to hear the learner profile being used as a frame for discussions with students throughout the building at any given time. I had the uh, pleasure of being in a class taught by Ms. Argyros and Ms. Fiore earlier in the year. 
And they were reminding students who were hesitant to participate in a discussion about adding sensory language to their memoirs that we are all risk takers, which is one of the IB learner profile attributes. And we work together to explore new ideas. And boy, let me tell you, did that get the ball rolling? The hands were going up, kids were participating. Just that mention of that attribute reminded students that it's so embedded in our learning community that we support one another as we develop these attributes um, throughout the school year and throughout the time in the middle years program at, LM at LMK. In addition to the overarching learner profile traits, the middle years program framework also highlights what's called approaches to learning skills, which is also depicted here. Uh, these skills are organized into five categories, thinking, social, communication, self-management, and research. And when planning units of study, teachers think about which skills students need in order to be successful throughout the unit, and then they explicitly teach those skills. So in addition to learning content, students are also learning how to develop important skills such as managing their emotions, setting goals and taking steps towards achieving them, thinking through um, you know, difficult situations um, and, uh, you know, managing different social interactions. And I, I had a chance to see this in action as well when I was observing one of Ms. Kranidi's algebra classes. I saw self-management skills come to life as students were being explicitly instructed as to how to organize complex information as they were graphing linear solutions to linear inequalities and involved different color writing utensils, knowing where to go for certain resources, um, where to place certain notes. And it really uh, you know, illustrated how students through the explicit instruction of these skills were well equipped, to well equipped to engage with challenging material and really set up for success. So approaches to learning skills not only support social and emotional learning, I would say they enhance it. So now I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Spector to continue to talk about everyday social and emotional learning in our community at LMK. Thank you, Ms. Egan. So in addition to the framework and the principles that the middle years program provides, there's some universal structures at LMK that nurture and support students' social emotional learning and growth starting at the very beginning of each day when they get there and they arrive at their home base. Home base is in many ways a community within a community where students have the opportunity to connect with two teachers and a smaller group of peers on a more personal level. This makes home base an ideal time for our weekly advisory program. In their weekly advisory sessions, the students are guided in their application of those approaches to learning that you heard Jen describe as they delve into a range of relevant, personalized, responsive topics. For example, I, I remember early in the year listening to sixth graders discussing uh, effective communication strategies and using them to navigate interpersonal relationships. And just last week, I was really blown away by eighth graders who were discussing the social and economic impact of the pandemic. As students at LMK develop and they grow as social and emotional learners through these universal structures like home base and advisory, they're also provided with an abundance of opportunities beyond the classroom. With over 20 clubs and after school activities offered and nearly 20 interscholastic teams, students at LMK are encouraged to take risks, experience new things, pursue whatever interests they have or think they might have as they become engaged, interested, well-rounded members of the school community. So the social and emotional support for all students at LMK is a constant. And it's a commitment that's truly woven into everything that we do. That's that lower part of the pyramid that you heard Ms. Melchewski describe. We also recognize that there are at times a need for more focused specific support that you heard Antonia referencing. So to share a little bit more about those approaches, I will now turn this over to Julie Snyder. Yes, um, as my colleagues have mentioned, um, I think we, we are very proud of the skilled work we do in, in this area. Um, our psychologists are highly trained in all sorts of clinical techniques. One of the things that I had mentioned in our opening over the summer is the fact that we have dialectical behavior therapy teams in place 
which are um, teams that teach skills to manage one's emotions. Um, as Dr. Wool mentioned, all of us have experienced the pandemic, both our teenagers, our tweens, our adolescents, um, adults, in various ways. Most of our of our of us are, are quite resilient. Um, and then there are those of us who for whom this has been a very difficult time and it's been more bumpy. Um, we are proud of the collaboration that our psychologists have had with the PE department to provide uh, these skills that are listed here in mindfulness and motion regulation, distress tolerance and interpersonal effectiveness to all of our students at LMK. And for those students who need a little bit more intensive support as they transition back, if things are a little bumpier, we certainly can provide that uh, support to your students. Please know our psychologists, our school counselors, our teachers have been very connected all year long. They've listened to your children. They're hearing their concerns. They've discussed what they're concerned about as they transition back. So we are just going to continue to keep our ears open, our eyes open. We, we know what to look for and we know um, how to refer out. So we're very excited. I think one of the best things is going to be for the majority of students is, is coming to school every day. Um, so just to continue on this idea of wellness, um, as I mentioned, there has been a really good collaboration between P physical education teachers and our psychologists and our school counselors. So I'm going to turn it back to Danny, we heard from a little bit before, to talk about you know, the mind, the connection between mind, body, and soul. Danny? Thank you, Julie. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, as Julie's mentioned before, um, we have an amazing, amazing PE staff here at LMK, probably some of the best around, and uh, Ms. Kiernan, Coach Sirocco, Coach Sirocco, and now um, Mr. Fish, who some of you may know <clears throat> from the high school as well. Um, our PE staff has partnered with the school psychologists here at LMK to create a great partnership in which they create uh, DBT lessons um, that students refer to and use during the Google Classroom now, during PE classes. These lessons are designed to help identify and change negative thinking patterns and pushes for positive behavioral changes. The lessons are done, you may have heard, they're done through the Google Classroom. Um, up to this point, um, they have done about six or seven lessons or so, and now going towards the end of the school year, they'll be having um, one or two lessons um, every, well, one lesson per week till the end of the school year. The lessons are partnered with a specific um, document that they have to answer a couple questions on pertaining to the videos that they watched. You know, we figured, we thought that the teaming up with the school psychologist would, would be a great idea um, to bring in the DBT um, aspect of it. You know, phys ed teachers are only teachers that see every single student every single year, all year round. So we know that T PE teachers are great at building relationship with students and are able to have these certain touch points with students every single day or, or twice a week whenever they see them. Our focus for PE this year has been uh, based a lot around movement. Um, with the pandemic, we had to change um, the way some of our units ran, the way we ran our classes with the, with the 12 foot social distancing and the lack of using of equipment. But our teachers have done a great job, a great job of, of organizing and changing the curriculum to the best of their ability. Um, currently, we are asking them to go outside as much as possible. We are outside as much as possible. Um, we are also using uh, PE classes as was mentioned previously before for mass breaks as best we can on days now where the weather is you know it's, ch it's changing for the best they're outside and moving and, and being active as much as possible we understand how much movement is how important movement is to the development of a child and how it'll help them focus throughout the day so PE is probably to them one of the better parts of the day and we're excited to have the students back in school um having PD PE classes two days a week as opposed to the to the one once every couple of days that they were having PE before um so yeah, on to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, you heard this mentioned before of our intramural program. This is mainly more for the seventh and eighth graders, uh, sixth graders, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second and going down the line here. Um, we were lucky enough, thanks to Dr. Wool, um, the Board of Education, Scott, Scott and Jen, and everybody else involved the central administration and the help of Mr. Galano, who's on here as a participant, um, to be able to be given the uh, ability to, to provide an athletic experience for the students. You know, section one came out and deemed that modified sports will not be happening 
in the fall for our students and in the winter as well. But we had um, we had great administration that you know gave us a go ahead and gave us a green light and gave us the support that we needed to provide something for the students and, and give them a, an experience that no other district in the area has offered. We were the only district to offer this to them. Um, in the fall, we had um, offered for, <clears throat> as many of you may know, for cross country, soccer, field hockey in the winter, we were able to run a, an intramural basketball program, which we had um, an in-house basketball league. We had 52 boys who came out for the basketball program, which we were able to break them down into teams and we ran a season in-house with ourselves. Uh, same thing we did with the girls basketball. Um, you know, wrestling was active, cheerleading was active. And even for hockey, you know, we weren't able to do a hockey season for the Modify this year, but we were still able to get them out there uh, and get them some ice time. So they, so they kept active and kept participating in something they loved and something they really enjoyed. Now moving forward, um, as many of you as seventh and eighth graders may know, fall two is, is back active again. So section has deemed that we are able to participate um, currently, we have football, volleyball, and cheer. Who are, what's going on? Um, going forward, now for next year, we're hoping, keep our fingers crossed, that we are able to have a, a fall season and and keep the the seasons going back in order how they used to, and we're able to compete again um, against other schools. This fall two this fall two season is a real season. So, football team will be playing uh, three games against other schools. The volleyball season actually kicks off tomorrow. Uh, we have two teams in maroon versus white, which will be kicking off the season against each other. And going on to the springtime, we're hoping that baseball, softball, and all these sports will be able to play and keep it, keep everything go, moving and, and keep these students active and keep them enjoying some daily love. Well, Danny's giving us all the credit, but before we go any further, I know Scott and I would agree that, you know, Danny is the newest member of our leadership team. He joined us in the middle of a pandemic. We tied both hands behind his back and said, get to know kids and try to create a program when no other district has one. And he did a fantastic job. I went down the gym whenever I needed to smile again to see kids actually having fun and connecting. So good work, Mr. Gonzalez. Very proud of what you accomplished in a very difficult circumstance. Thank you. Scott, who's handling this one? Is this me? I believe this is you. All right, well, I miss kids terribly. Those of you that know me know I'm a little bit crazy. I've never missed a concert or a performing arts performance in my 20 years as superintendent and I can't wait to bring them back primarily because it's just like with athletics it's a way to see kids connect uh, and be almost form their own unique communities it's phenomenal and our program is one that we should be proud of but it has persisted uh, at the middle school despite um, all of the obstacles and we hope to bring it back in a, in a more full form as we return students to school as you know we're lobbying to get that 12 foot reduced to six, because we think that's safe. But this slide is a celebration of some of the things that will be seem a lot different now that we have all of our kids back. The Skylarks, the jazz band, the dance club, drama, all county band. Um, we're gonna, as Scott mentioned, our band lessons will occur in school, which is really exciting for us. Um, you're going to see, I think, more participation in after school activities. We are one of the few middle schools that has an elective in art and digital design. We're really proud of those things and theater and chorus. So when we talk about social and emotional learning, as Julie said, it's the whole person. We're trying to see the mind body connection. We don't know which part of the work is going to excite your child. And so we wanna make sure that they're all available even this in this somewhat uh, difficult environment, but um, we're excited. We think that the, our, our performing arts program has done a, a remarkable job, but now that the kids are back and they're gonna see their teachers more regularly and get to perform in person, things are going to pick up. And as soon as we can bring back live performance, we will. Next slide. Okay, so this is what's on the mind of lots of people. It's this, this theory that how do you know where our kids are? You know, and I have this lighthouse next to me because honestly, for a very long time, we've been living in the darkness, but I think things have gotten better. There is a new day dawning and I want you to know that we have not been in the dark in terms of where your children are, where they should be and where they're going. And for many people, it's a little bit daunting to say, well, my child's missed a year of schooling. That's not completely true because our teachers have done a remarkable job of working with your kids and keeping them engaged. 
And those of you that remember, you know, we, we had a summer program last year. We trained our teachers really well. We focused on modifying our curriculum. But when we get to this next part, I think what you're going to learn is that Mr. Greenfield, our assistant superintendent for instruction, working with our teachers and all of these fine instructional leaders, have been thinking about where your kids were, where they should have been had there been no pandemic, and how we can get them to the next phase of learning. And we see this return to school, not as get the kids back to school, but as the beginning of a three-step journey. We're going to use the rest of the year to build capacity, to make them comfortable. We're going to use the summer as a springboard. And by the time we get to September, I think your kids are going to be just fine and feel as really connected and ready for the academic journey ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, I'm going to turn this to you. Thank you, Dr. Wool. So as, as Dr. Wool um, pointed out, we see uh, the return in a few weeks now as the first stage of a three-part process, the three-phase, leading to, of course, uh, September, where uh, we're working backwards to make sure that everything that is possible to be done to prepare your children for the next grade level is done, and that includes um, a comprehensive plan for summer programs that will support students who um, have perhaps not kept up as well, have struggled during the pandemic, um, but also to enrich others who uh, have uh, done quite well. And we know, as Ms. Malczewski um, said, every child has experienced this pandemic uh, differently. And so our goal is to be systemic, be systematic about our approach to um, ensuring that we know where your child is academically, but also to uh, ensure that we personalize uh, the uh, instruction um, at the, obviously in the classroom level by our expert teachers through summer programmatic uh, plans. And also we know that uh, our curriculum will need some modifications uh, and adjustments as we learn from our summer and as we have your your children back uh, every day and we continue to monitor their progress. We'll make adjustments along the way. Please go to the next slide. So that's the what, this three-phase process. How? Um, well, Harrison is as positioned, perhaps better positioned than uh, many districts in terms of being able to handle uh, what was an extraordinary uh, year. First, a virtual uh, shift from last year when the pan, pan, excuse me, when the pandemic hit, followed by um, adjustments to our summer program, and then uh, a hybrid learning uh, model that we put in place in September, but by design. We use a five-step process for all the work that we do instructionally. We conduct extensive research. We are a research-based organization. We look at international and national studies. We partner with uh, national assessment organizations like the NWEA MAP. We've uh, um, built a data warehousing system so that we have our own psychometrics to be able to rely on so that um, the state who tend to shift with every wind with uh, new, uh, new learning uh, goals, um, we have standards that we measure annually. And for the last 10 years, we've worked with NWEA uh, to ensure that uh, we have progress monitoring tools that are standardized, that are consistent, that are aligned to uh, New York State standards. So uh, in a nutshell, what we're saying is we do research externally, but we also do internal research. We're um, throughout this year, we've collected data on students' pr progress against the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program standards, in addition to New York State standards, and those are being collected internally using uh, classroom-based assessments. And we collect and we know your, your children. Um, we've also looked at um, national exemplars and we continue to refine and adjust our program design as we need to. And we've learned a tremendous amount uh, from the hybrid model. And you're going to hear a little bit more from that in a few moments from Dr. Cantor, uh, who's our director of English language arts, Ms. D'Andrea, who's our director of math, and Ms. Colonna, who's our director of social studies, they're gonna take you uh, in a deeper dive of uh, this five-step uh, process. To give you uh, just one more uh, brief on how we're planning for this summer, 
Um, after we've conducted the research, and I know somebody in the early part of this meeting asked um, if reading scores have increased as they've heard in some other districts. And we can tell you safely that yes, many students' reading scores have increased. Some have remained constant, others have not. And students have responded very differently to the pandemic. But here's what we do want you to know. Our teachers know your individual child um, as a student and our district leaders at the director level, looking from a, uh, from a, um, a curriculum-based perspective and from a classroom-based perspective, your principals uh, know the individual uh, children. So uh, our program design is dependent on what we know about your, your children and how we personalize those uh, programs. Couple more highlights. Last year, um, we expanded our summer program to include more than 120 uh, middle school students that heretofore hadn't uh, received summer opportunities. And we will continue that uh, program this summer and we're planning on ways to expand so that there will be um, intervention programs to ensure that students who have fallen behind are given opportunities to accelerate and catch up and enrichment opportunities so that those who are either meeting or exceeding standards will have other kinds of opportunities to get engaged back in school, back to the overall social and emotional uh, wellness. And we use the summer to conduct action research. Our teachers participate in professional development, bar none. Uh, last summer, we had more than 75 courses. Those courses are used to plan and redesign instruction for students. And they also serve as lab environments so we can study what works in classrooms. And this year, we uh, used last summer to plan for our hybrid. And this summer, we'll uh, likely build labs to help us uh, figure out how to accelerate learning for students and how to adjust curriculum dependent on what we're learning in the spring about their progress. Um, and of course, we implemented all this, we supervise it. Our summer basically runs from uh, the end of June all the way through the opening day in September. And uh, you'll see evidence of that both on our website with learning-based resources and in all of our teachers who participate in teaching during the summer. And of course, uh, we're committed to making sure we um, are, um, that we monitor our own progress and evaluate our own work. And we use outside experts to help us do that. And we internally um, conduct those evaluations so that we never stand still and we're always uh, improving. So it's a continuous improvement process. So if we move on to the next slide, Dr. Cantor is gonna join me uh, to share a little bit more about how we, we call it triangulating data. But basically we look at multiple points of student performance to ensure that we're not missing uh, performance gaps or strengths because one piece of data might not tell us everything we want to know. And uh, I did mention the NWA map. We have these data for multiple years. So we're looking at three years of performance. And then we um, look at the current year's performance against national standards of growth. Dr. Cantor. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Um, so we are, our approach is dependent on this notion of multiple measures. And what that means is not one moment in time defines your child, not one test, not one time that they're sitting in class, rather classroom artifacts, those moments where they raise their hand, um, the common internal assessments that their teachers give, their own reflections on how they're doing as learners, as well as teacher feedback. And all of that together gives us insight, as Dr. Will mentioned, to know where they are and where they need to go. And that's how, that's not new. This is not, um, this is an outgrowth of the pandemic. This has been an anchor to personalizing learning. That notion of personalizing learning is dependent on us looking at all of these measures together. Um, Ms. DeAndrea, do you wanna to speak towards an example of that? Sure, thank you, Dr. Cantor. So Dr. Cantor mentioned the types of assessment that we use and, and one of them is what we call formative assessment which really refers to the ongoing check-ins that happen before, during, or after lessons. And in math classrooms, teachers have always used formative assessment to provide feedback to our students. This year, we've learned to use uh, a digital platform called GoFormative, which allows teachers to give live assignments to students and make immediate adjustments to their teaching. 
This tool has really enhanced our practice by allowing teachers to closely review student work as they're actively solving problems in class and provide them with more targeted feedback in real time than we've ever been able to do in the past. And so for instance, in seventh grade, as students are currently working to solve equations, teachers such as Ms. Reed, Ms. Wamakai, or Ms. Vendetto are able to provide individual students with very specific feedback about how they can accurately and efficiently solve multi-step algebraic equations. And so while students are working on these problems independently, teachers are able to examine each piece of work. And if students receive this feedback from their teachers in real time as they're thinking and working aloud, they're able to ask clarifying questions, make revisions to their work, and apply what they're learned in that moment rather than waiting for perhaps the next day. And this allows our teachers to review each student's progress and provide them with personalized steps on what to do next, whether that means reteaching a skill or extending a student's learning on a given topic. Next slide, please. So as many of my colleagues have mentioned, everyone has experienced the last year quite differently. And in fact, we found that there have been tremendous benefits towards our teaching practice and student learning, including the approaches to learning Ms. Egan explained earlier in the presentation. So some highlights have included opportunities for increased student voice. We found that the asynchronous environment has resulted in increased independence and students have learned to collaborate with peers and in new in innovative ways, some of which we probably would have never thought possible before this year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cantor and Ms. Colonna, who will share with you some additional examples of this work with you. Thank you. So as English teachers, it's our business to think about writer's voice and how to increase students' writer's voice. Um, this year, um, teachers are have done creative writing where students are writing short stories. And this isn't different than the past. This is a practice that they've done for some time. But this year, teachers have capitalized on some of the tech technological tools, um, like a program called, a platform called Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a place where students can record and upload videos of themselves talking, and then they post it and students can give feedback. Now, um, I had a chance to listen to some of these stories and listening to students read aloud their, um, their tales, which were extremely creative. Um, and what I loved about it is I could hear their voice. I could hear their writer's voice. Um, they took on their character's dialogue and whispered or screamed into the camera. And sometimes they slow down the most important parts to um, engage their audience. So these are powerful shifts um, that this experience has really afforded us and that we will carry forward. And with that, I'll pass it off to Ms. Colonna. Great, thank you, Dr. Cantor. As we leave the hybrid instructional model to return to five days a week of live instruction, we're gonna to continue to build on the skill sets that were emphasized during the hybrid period. Student choice creating opportunities for students to express their unique voice. Independent study skills, emphasizing those cross-subject skills that will help kids be successful in whatever professional endeavors they may choose in the future. And of course, emphasizing as we always have collaborative learning techniques, but not only in person now, we've all become so much more well-versed in the many technological platforms that allow us to communicate both in school and at real time at home. A prime example of this is the seventh grade project on the Civil War that your students will be completing when they return to school this fourth quarter. The beauty of the MYP framework is that while it emphasizes content acquisition, it doesn't stop there. Knowing stuff is not enough. Kids have to actually apply that knowledge to something that's purposefully meaningful to them. So in this particular unit, the students have already been taught the content about the Civil War. They've been assessed in a traditional manner. But then we go beyond that to having kids actually make meaning of that information in a medium and to an audience that they choose. So here are an example of many different choices that they might have to present their knowledge. Um, to give 
give you just a few. A student might choose to write a children's book, in which case the audience would be younger students and making that knowledge accessible to them. Or they might choose to have a movie trailer where they create an exciting way to hook people in from the general population who might not exactly have a love or passion for history. Whichever one of these they choose, the student designs the project from the very beginning to the end. So the student is able to design a project, design an action plan to fulfill that project, cooperate with their teacher and with other students to bring that, uh, that vision that they have for this passion to fruition. In this way, we allow students to really take charge of their own learning, right? They're not being passive in this MYP framework. They're able to use this information to convey it in a way that's really important to them and speaks to their own personal understanding of the subject. We are tremendously excited to have your students back in person. I can't tell you how hard our teachers are working to create an environment for them that's engaging when they return, a smooth transition, but most importantly, a joyful transition. Thank you so much for allowing me just a tidbit to explain to you some of the activities that your kids are going to enjoy when they return in person. Thank you. I was trying to decide which one I would pick. That's a, that's a lot of options there. I, I definitely don't think I would do the rap song. I'm just not that good at singing. Uh, I, mean, I think the point that was made so well, though, in, in all seriousness, is that the work that we do every day with your kids is going to be amplified when they come back to school. At the heart of our school is voice, choice, agency, all the things that uh, our team just described. And that is part, the instructional program is really part of the social and emotional learning at our middle school. Um, and that's not new for your teachers. I, I can tell you that they do this every day and uh, they're, they're more than ready. I think that they may be as excited as your children to, to get everybody back to school. Are we on to the next slide? All right, uh, let me know who's handling this. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take this summer, summer program. So one of the things that's really important is that we continue to go forward as you heard me say earlier, we're thinking about the last few months of school year, the summer and beyond. That was referenced earlier by Michael and some of the directors. And this summer, we're in the planning stage of developing programs that are for academic extension, enrichment, as we did last summer, as well as ways that we can bring together the community. Um, one of the celebratory moments in the summertime, last summer and every summer, is our annual sixth grade browse and brunch our end of the year Husky Day, when we bring together fifth graders in connections for the first time. And we're gonna look at multiple opportunities to do that this summer. The enrichment workshops, we have some students who in two and three week modules, or perhaps even longer, can get together and really uh, connect in ways in person, we hope, for ways to learn and extend their knowledge. Because we have some high, high flying learners, some of them were involved in recently in our science fair um, and our science Olympiad. And we also want to ensure that there is appropriate means for students who need that academic extension, whether it be in mathematics or literacy. And this was an outgrowth last year that we began for the first time in the middle school, and it was highly successful in small modules. And we're going to continue to grow that this summer. Thank you, Scott. And we really are excited that this program will be designed in real time. That's why we don't have all the answers for you yet, because we're trying to determine what will this program will look like to fit the needs of your children as they finish school. Are we on to our next slide? This is our final slide, actually, Dr. Mo. So, so before you say goodbye, let me say a few things because I, I like this slide very much. I like the picture of our new entryway there to the auditorium. I see, I, is that your office staff? It is on both sides. Very nice. The important people that help us get our work done every day. But I want to just thank the important people on this screen tonight and all of our teachers that are participating tonight via Zoom. Um, this has been a very tough time for everybody. I know parents, you're tired. Your kids have been through a lot. Uh, but I will say that I, I spend a lot of time singling folks out. I just want to single out the administrative team of mine who have worked pretty much um, night and day seven days a week since this began, uh, whether it's been contact tracing or 
showing up on weekends to recruit teachers in the middle of a pandemic to fill vacancies. We continue to see um, a level of commitment that I think makes our district unlike any other. Um, we didn't need or wait for other people to give us direction. We found our own. Uh, and we will continue to do that because we think it is our job to do the homework and the research that makes this work for your kids. Um, there will be some bumps in the road. And I, I need to say to all of you, moms and dads, um, be patient. Give some grace to your teachers. They are uh, exhausted. They have started and restarted and restarted again. They've experienced all kinds of change throughout the course of the year, and now they will be experiencing another profound change. I promise you they're fully committed to taking care of your children, but we need to show each other patience and a sense of um, community that indicates we value one another. We're going to get some things wrong. We're going to listen to one another. We're going to move your kids forward in a way that will do them the honor that they deserve. They deserve a community that shows respect and cares for each person. And we need your help. I'm gonna remind you of that. There are a bunch of questions in here about will school close again? Who will determine that? Most of that, frankly, is out of my hands. At some point, they'll establish a parameter under which they say a community infection rate is X, you need to shut down or you need to go hybrid again. The way to work against that is for us to work together. Remember what we've put in place for you, surveillance testing, vaccinated teachers, excellent ventilation, and high level of attention to protocols that maintain safe and health, healthy environments. We know that this will work. We've seen it work in the research and we've seen it work in our own schools. I'm not worried about bringing more kids back or I wouldn't. I didn't do it based on barriers. That was the guidance that New York State gave us. Barriers to me are a meaningless mitigation. They're a feel good piece of theater. What we did was we spent $700,000 to ensure that the air in your classrooms is cleaned on a regular basis. That's an investment for COVID and going forward. It'll reduce flu, it'll reduce colds. It'll keep our children safe and our teachers safe and our faculty safe and our staff safe over the longer term. So this is a commitment that we need to make to one another. We can do this but it's going to take a we. I can assure you we have worked as hard as we can and we'll be ready for your kids when they return. Look for a letter from me uh, over the spring break that reaffirms the start date of uh, April 7th. I don't anticipate anything getting in the way, but one never knows. Again, I wanna thank our school board, um, Kelly Kozak who's here tonight and Rob Sullivan who's here tonight. Without their um, determined leadership, I wouldn't be able to do the things we do. Oftentimes we do things quite differently than other school districts because the only thing we think about is what is in the best interest of your kids. I was Sometimes just about to chime in for a second. I wanted to say thank you. I think that that was an incredible presentation, extremely thought out. You all did a wonderful job and owned your craft. Um, and just to thread the needle a little bit, I just wanna remind everyone that every single decision that is made at every level in this district is first and foremost with the health and safety of all of your children and the teachers and faculty and staff. And I have nothing but confidence. And again, there will be bumps in the road, there will be mistakes. And if there's ever a question, please don't wait till the next PTA meeting. Don't wait, just email your principal, assistant principal, your teacher, make a call and communicate because communication is what's going to keep this afloat. And yeah, we're the, we're at the end of, I mean, we are at the finish line. So it's very exciting and I'm just thrilled. So thank you again. This was fabulous. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, I want to thank you, Scott, for the work that you've done this year under difficult circumstances. Um, every member of your team, every teacher that's on this call, you all have our heartfelt thanks because there is absolutely no way we would have been able to do this if you hadn't been resilient, if you haven't kept at it. And I've changed my background because that's where we're going next, folks. We're going to have a celebration of your children before this year is over. Uh, that would be one we can all be proud of. 
Mr. Freed, your turn to say good night. Thank you, Dr. Wilman. Thank you for your uh, stewardship. And uh, I will tell you, uh, I don't know if you ever sleep because how hard you're working to make sure that this happens. Um, this is the staff that you'd want to go into any situation with. And while I never want to go through pandemics again, um, if I have to, I want the LMK staff with me. And when I say staff, I mean the incredible teachers and the staff you see, some of which on the screen and Linda Marsico, my, my secretary, who I could not go through this without. She is, along with Christina and Joanne, the office, just my heroes. Um, I want to thank this community. Um, you know, you continue to be a support and you know that your children need to be in school and you've been persistent in reminding us that again and again and understanding we've made shifts. And the time is now, which is why it says it up there. Um, I will tell you, I have enjoyed the small classes. I've enjoyed being the principal of what feels like a tiny school. I really have. I've enjoyed having two schools. But the time is now for me to be the principal of one unified learning community. Um, that's what I'm here for. That's what I want to see. I want to see lots of kids in the holes. I want the noise to pick up. Um, I want to go into a classroom of 20 students and hear multiple voices. And it's on its way. And we're ready for it. And every staff member that comes to my office asks the question, What's the date? What's the date? So I can plan accordingly. They're ready. They want your children here. And so our future unified learning community awaits you. And we will hopefully see you exactly early in the morning on April 7th, all of you. And have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.